and you then would be an agreement that financial reform for election campaigns would be uh, a foundation for making this happen? Absolutely, yes. So then we have to figure out how to make that happen. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I have another question. Um, was there anything more in that one that you wanted to say? No. Nope. Okay. Um, your movie is a, a call to action for change. But most actions have repercussions, and when Martin Luther King was leading his peaceful protests, he warned that people would be arrested or could be arrested for their activities or have different communities turn against them. So what repercussions do you think people uh, should be aware of as they begin to change themselves and the status quo? And what do you envision people will personally have to change in their lives? Kimberly, is anything you must say about that? Go first, and then I will. Well, the first things that come to mind for me is the images of those students uh, sitting on the lawn up at UC Davis uh, and mm-hmm. sitting there while they and their friends were pepper sprayed. Uh, I still I think about that every day and think to myself, could I have sat there and remained nonviolent while that police officer was you know, putting this toxin substance into the bodies of all of those young people who were just sitting on the lawn. and uh, But at the same time, I watched over the next few days as the modern media, you know, lots of people had their, their little uh, mobile cameras, um, and, you know, it was up on YouTube within hours, and the whole world got to see and judge that event. <clears throat> and that police officer was laid off, and they had to retrench from some of those, those kinds of strategies. So it was the same as with Martin Luther King. He was very strategic as much as possible about doing his protests where there were going to be cameras so that the moral outrage of the traditional behavior was obvious and could influence a lot greater number of people than happened to be there for the event. <clears throat> so that's one of the things that I would observe in terms of what people are going to need to face. You know, in, when, when the Egyptian students needed to take to the streets again, once they realized that leaving the military in power didn't get them the kind of freedoms they were looking for. I think there were something like 37 people killed. You know, it's a, it's a very serious and dangerous game, even violent, nonviolent uh, protesting. So that's one whole area where I just can't express enough of my admiration of the courage of these people who are taking the streets to get other people's attention on the issues. And then the second thing I would say is that on a much more personal level, David Icke talks in the film about the importance of each person recognizing the challenge of stepping outside of their own, what he calls the hassle-free zone. When you start talking about um, a conspiracy, when you start talking about free energy or UFOs, when you even start talking bluntly about liberty, it can be very challenging with your own spouse, you know, with your other family members, with the people at work. Um, and people are going through that now by the hundreds and thousands and millions really across the planet through things like Thrive, which are waking people up to, to new perspectives as they decide whether or not to bring these topics up with the people who, who trust them and whether, as they decide whether or not to you know, give a copy of Thrive to somebody as a Christmas present. It's a big challenge for each one of us to risk our reputation, our credibility, our social relationships and so forth, and we're each deciding on a daily basis now, okay, what is our priority in terms of uh, comfort and discomfort, in terms of truth versus, uh, you know, illusion or, you know, soft compromises and so forth. So I don't have any absolute definitive answer, but I do know that in my experience it's consistent that the truth will keep arising that love is the most powerful force uh, that I've ever seen, and that at our core, that's who human beings are, and we're waking up to that, and that that cannot be stopped, ultimately. Yeah. I guess one little thing I want to add to that is that I really think it's important for each of us to know what is true for us. Like, for me, I know speaking up, you know, and um, being one who's been willing to bring up the uncomfortable... uh, conversations and and be bold in my opinions and outspoken and all of that like that's never well 
it's certainly never been comfortable for me. I don't think it's comfortable for most people. And yet, uh, for me, it's been really important to realize the discomfort of not speaking up and or the discomfort of not taking action. Whatever it is, whatever part there is, whether you're someone who's going to go be on the streets or, you know, make a film or whatever your your own particular part to play in this is, I think that it ultimately just brings us face-to-face with ourselves. And I know for me it's been a matter of recognizing how much pain and turmoil there is going on all the time right now so that it's not like we're going to um, cause pain <laughs> that isn't actually already happening. It's already a complete mess. So when people want to know, well, what about this or that, it's like we're already in a, in a horrible state for most people on the planet. And then the other part is, for me, I know for both um, Foster and I, we've thought a lot about, like, just how well do we sleep at night? That's the bottom line, and that has to do with come terms with your own sense of integrity and what's called for, and who do you want to be? Uh, who do you, you want to show up as? A number of people have said to us, why in the world are you taking all these risks? You know, you guys could just be retired on a beach in Tahiti sipping Mai Tais or something like that. And for us, it's not even a question. The notion of our children and grandchildren and our loved ones and our, our species going forward on this gorgeous planet in some sort of oppressive police state, if there's something that we can do about that, that doing something about that with its inherent risks is so much more of a draw than cowering in fear somewhere, just taking care of ourselves for a few years, <clears throat> while knowing that other people are becoming more and more vulnerable. Neither of us would be able to sleep uh, at night or live with ourselves were we to choose that option. So we were blessed to have the, the privilege of some time and some resources to follow these questions, you know, create a, a coherent representation of what we found, and then offer it out to other people to try to save them some time. Well, I can see that you're leading with compassion, and, and that's really given you the courage to do everything that you've done, and I, I'm sure many, many, many people really appreciate that. But I'm wondering if you've been received any threats or any – what repercussions have you had that you would be willing to talk about? Well, I'm thrilled to say that we haven't had a single uh, – really, we haven't had a single threat we haven't had anything that I would call hate mail. You know, with, there are plenty of debunkers, you know, who try to, to undermine our reputation, but no uh, hate mail or threats uh, at all. I can't guarantee that will continue. But uh, we also tried to be as strategic as we could with our communication and stay completely under the radar until our message was ready to be delivered to the world. And now, as Kimberly said, that toothpaste is out of the tube. And if somebody tries to hassle us at this point, you know, we've, we now have you know, a network of, of um, over a million people around the world who are in very much in support of what we do, and we're, in, we're connected with them electronically, and, you know, we've, got, we've taken precautions of having all sorts of backup servers and so forth, so uh, it would only validate what we're saying if they were to try to somehow actually harm us at this point. So uh, we... We, we don't can't, need that validation. I think we're validated. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we can't guarantee any, anything in the future, but uh, it's certainly operating in alignment with our own integrity and with what we perceive to be natural principles is, is really the only choice for us at this point. In fact, let me tell one real quick story. that uh, There's a, a guy that uh, whose work I followed for a while who has interviewed a number of uh, so-called refugees from the Illuminati. And these are anonymous interviews, but y- you can tell that they're very uh, knowledgeable uh, about what's going on on the inside. And, and again and again, these these uh, people, when they tell their stories, they talk about how the, the would-be controllers sit around and they've got so much under their control with the media and the money and education and food and all that kind of stuff, but they can't seem to get it all wrapped up. And they keep referring to what they call the X factor, which is no matter how hard they try, no matter how much force or money or deception they use, the X factor keeps popping through. And they're not sure what it is. <laughs> and But if you hear their descriptions of it, it's really love and truth. You know, it's the life force 
expressing itself. And that's one of the things that gives me confidence because I know that the people perpetrating this agenda are in great pain and they're, they're not aligned with the life force. So I know from my experience as a martial artist and particularly in Aikido that, that, that the true power, the unlimited power comes from aligning your body, your breath, your emotions, your thinking and, and your actions with the life force, not trying to control or suppress it. I want to say one thing about um, our, our strategy with this also, which was really the most dangerous time for us was in the making of the movie um, because we specifically chose a release strategy that would, we, we used to call it getting the toothpaste out of the tube, as we've mentioned a few times, because you just can't put toothpaste back in a tube <laughs> once it's out. And that was our idea, was to get this thing out globally fast. So as soon as it was out on the Internet, we knew that we were safer then than we had ever been, really, because it was to shut us down before we had the base of people understanding what we were doing. So I think, I know, actually, I felt a tremendous release on 11.11 that I hadn't even known I was carrying until it was released, um, that we made it, that, that we got that out, and that since then, you know, the conversation's been distracted from the content. You know, people go after our reputations, as Foster said, and slander us and, um, you know, distract distract from the content um, with other issues. But enough, there has been no um, real intelligent um, taking apart the content of the movie and no direct threat um, to us for doing it. And I think that that's partly because of the safety that we uh, gained by going out so quickly. Well, I appreciate that. I have another question to ask you, which is your movie and websites, uh, they're an example of using the power of truth that Gandhi spoke of to expose the architects of domination and to initiate the process of bringing integrity to our current situation. On a practical level, what percentage of our population do you feel is needed to reach a critical mass in understanding the history and current actions of the elite and how we can, you know, how we can begin to bring about this change? I'll, I'll address that for a minute because I've done some research on that because that was a burning question for me uh, of what would a tipping point be like statistically. And some key data points for me was, well, I already mentioned that the Supposedly, the American Revolution was 5 to 6 percent. Uh, Ken Wilber, whose work I respect a lot, says that it takes 10 percent, around 10 percent of a population adopting a, a, a new, more advanced worldview to actually shift the paradigm. And then uh, a friend of ours, Paul Ray, uh, who has been the main researcher behind the, the statistics around the spread of cultural creatives uh, and that paradigm around the world, uh, in his recent studies, the, the number of cultural creatives, and for those who are not familiar with that term, it means basically people who are willing to shape their lifestyle around things like social justice uh, and environmental sustainability. Uh, the, the, the numbers of those people in uh, Europe, Japan, and the United States is now, in all three areas, up around 35%. So combining all of that with the... The, as long as we can keep the Internet open and how fast people are getting uh, educated and organized and, and active, um, I think we're very close to a tipping point. Wow. Well, thank you very much.